For today's program, let's turn our hearts and our minds to things that are vastly more important than just today's news headlines. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. Most days on this program, we generally have been talking about the news of the day, the things we need to understand in this world around us. The world had changed by politics and a pandemic. And some of the things that I have fears about for the days ahead, for those that are simply not prepared. It is the primary reason that we do this program, Truth to Ponder. I want to start at the beginning of this program, before I get into what I really want to talk about. Just take a moment to thank all of you that have been listening these past weeks and months since the program started. We began at the end of August and have been on the air every day, Monday through Friday since, and also as a podcast. And I want to thank those that let me know that you are listening on the radio, listening as a podcast. Each week, the program has grown significantly, and I I can tell that by the, the number of emails that I get and even the letters you send. And I want to thank you for taking the time to be so supportive. It means more to me than you will ever know. When I took on this mantle of doing this program, I wondered, would I be up to the task? I wondered if I could maintain this schedule, doing it uh, five days a week. I used to have enough trouble doing a a once-a-week, one-hour program called Your Weekend Show. I really thought hard about it, prayed about it, and just felt very strongly that I needed to make the change and do the program. When I started, it was way before the election, and I kind of wondered how that election would turn out. While many of my friends were saying, oh, it's a shoe-in for for Donald Trump, look at the rallies, I, I had this deep down, if you listen to the program, you'll know I kept saying, if... I never felt confident that he would. And then I'm hearing all these so-called prophets of God saying he's going to win. And and I realized, no, we're coming into a different time. And I think a time that we have, for lack of a better term, earned. We as the faithful Christians, supposedly, have many times failed in the work that we're supposed to do in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And today's program, we're going to just get away from the news headlines, enough of the politics. It's time to to think about the sacred, the wonder of it all in Jesus Christ, the the fact that he gave his life on on the cross for you and I to, to be saved. We oftentimes forget, we get so wrapped up in our politics, we forget about the important things we need to be doing. And it's an easy thing to do. But today I want to take our minds into a more sacred place. I want to take us back 2,000 years ago to Jerusalem. On yesterday's program, we talked about what is called Maundy Thursday, the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples, washed their feet, gave them the new commandment, also They celebrated that first communion there that night. Shortly after, then he is taken, he's he's taken prisoner after he's prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes before, before Caiaphas the king and then ultimately Pontius Pilate. It's quite a story. And it is the center story of what the Christian faith is all about. And sometimes we forget, sometimes many of us look at at the church or did. Well, I go to be entertained. I go to feel good about myself. I go to be encouraged. Well, yeah, we are to be encouraged. But if we actually really worshipped our Lord in spirit and in truth and not trying to go into it like a concert and trying to feel good about me, I think we would get more out of our worship experience. Jesus gave us and his disciples and all of us today wonderful gifts. And oftentimes we have traded in weekly communion for a rock concert. 
And I don't think that was ever the design and intent. So many people are trying to to reinvent the faith in their own image. Today, I want to start that journey to Calvary. I want to bring you back to that time when the crowds yelled and screamed to crucify him. Jesus was scourged. He was whipped. He was beaten. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head. As the hymn writer said, he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis a Christ by man rejected, yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis a long-expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord. By his Son now God has spoken, tis the true and faithful word. Tell me ye who hear him groaning, was there ever grief like this? To fear his cause disowning, foes insulting his distress. Many hands were raised to wound him, none would enter, post to save. But the deepest stroke that pierced him was a stroke that just escaped. Suppose evil gray, you may view it nature rightly, hear its guilt may estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load. Tis the word the Lord's anointed. Son of man and Son of God. Here we have a firm foundation, here the refuge of the lost. Christ the rock of our salvation, is the name of which we boast. Lamb of God for sinners wounded, sacrifice to cancel guilt. None shall ever be confounded who on him their hope had built. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. As a child, it was always hard to to comprehend what Good Friday meant. And today, this Friday edition of Truth to Ponder and your weekend edition, I want to take a little time to remember what it was like back 2,000 years ago. Jesus had just come to Jerusalem just days before with everybody praising him and going Hosanna in the highest blessed is he that comes in in the name of the Lord they really believed that Jesus was going to be their political savior to to overthrow with power and might the grip of the Roman Empire they truly believed that's what the Messiah was all about all about politics and and too many people that call themselves Christians today get wrapped up into more politics than the sharing of the gospel and the good news. 2,000 years ago, 
2,000 years ago, the people turned on Jesus. One of his own disciples betrayed him. Peter denied him in the Garden of Gethsemane three times. I don't know the man. And as Jesus was taken away by the Roman soldiers, first to Caiaphas the king, the disciples scattered and disappeared into the shadows. And that next day, after Caiaphas, and he's before Pilate, Pilate trying to make it possible for Jesus to live, you know, I'll give you this Barabbas guy, this really horrible murderer. No, crucify Jesus is what the the crowd demanded. The powers of hell were on earth urging the, the crowd there to kill the living Son of God. But it had to be done for the redemption of mankind. I can't imagine what it would have been like that day. So many people in Jerusalem because of all that was going on that week. There, as Jesus is carrying his cross on the way of sorrows, the Via Della Rosa. soldiers led Jesus to the streets of Jerusalem out the city gates to a hill called Calvary, also known as the place of the skull. 
And there they they stripped him of his clothes. They cast lots for his clothing, which fulfilled the scripture. And they nailed him, not tied him. They nailed him to this cross. They put a sign above his head, a note saying, King of the Jews. And there Jesus is lifted up. And there on that execution day, he's between two thieves. On the cross, Jesus is recorded to have had seven statements that we need to remember today. First, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus understood what he was doing. He knew that he was now taking on the sins of the whole world and giving his life blood to redeem us from our sins. The two others that were being crucified with him that day began to mock him, saying, hey, if you're really the son of God, save us and save yourself too while you're at it. The one thief suddenly recognized who and what Jesus was all about and suddenly realized that he was getting his just punishment. Jesus was not. And he goes, Lord, he calls him Lord and and wants to be a part of his kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And then to his mother, he tells her that John says, woman, behold thy son, one of his apostles, and, and son, behold thy mother. As the day tarries on, And people are watching him slowly die this cruel and painful death. I'm sure many of them still mocked him, getting their just vengeance upon this guy that said, I'm I'm the Messiah, but he wasn't there to get rid of the Romans. They never understood that they had a need for a savior. And at that point, he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he goes, I thirst, and he's given vinegar and myrrh to to alleviate some of the suffering on a sponge. And then, and then he's realizing all that is happening, and he, he declares, it is finished. In other words, he realized he had the sins of all mankind upon him. He's about to pay the price for you and I to have access to the Father, to to repair the breach made by the fall of man in the garden. It is finished. And then he declares for all to hear, Father, into thy hands, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. The one who is bleeding and dying, crying out.
I try to find a way in my mind to go back to that time. To try to understand and perhaps even to some degree experience what those people saw that day with Jesus on the cross. Remember, many of these people had seen some of the miracles of Jesus. Many had turned their backs on him now because they were looking for a political savior, and he was not their political savior. Scripture records in the book of Matthew, and we're looking at Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Darkness over the land as Jesus died. And at that ninth hour, Jesus cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And if we go down a little bit farther, we realize that we get to the point that Jesus gives up the ghost, as it says in the book of Matthew. He dies. He dies. And when that happened, at the moment that Jesus dies on the cross, there's a great earthquake, darkness over the land. And the veil in the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. In the temple at that time, there was a veil to separate everybody, the people from the Holy of Holies. Nobody could enter there. And that veil was the barrier that no man could dare cross. And now as Jesus dies, that veil is rent in two. We now, because of Jesus and his sacrifice, we have access to the Father. The book of Matthew also records that in verse 53, and came out of the graves after his resurrection were some of the bodies of the saints. They rose from the dead. When the centurion who was there to supervise, to oversee these crucifixions. When he saw all this and he had seen the earthquake, he suddenly was afeared, as it says. He was afraid. And he recognized truly this was the Son of God. Truly this was the Son of God. And I have to wonder... And I have to wonder as I I think back at that time, what did other people think? The day started out so normally when they got up. Passover behind them. It is still the Passover day when Jesus dies. And now he's being crucified. And there's an arrogance that I'm sure the Sanhedrin and those that hated Christ, they, hey, we got rid of this guy that is threatening our domain and the way we do business. But as darkness descended on the land, the earthquake, the temple veil rent in two. I wonder what they were thinking at that point in time. What have we wrought upon ourselves? And yet they were still afraid. They had heard that he said that he would only be in the grave for three days. Guards were sent to secure the grave. The blood that Jesus shed, he then brings to the Father. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ, those that believe upon him shall be saved. I was rich. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide. Left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. Into glory 
go back in my mind to that time and I try to envision what it would have been like to have been there on that day on that day that Jesus was crucified to be a spectator to be in that crowd maybe not even thoroughly understanding all that was going on we think of that week and let's put it in context of what may have very well have occurred This was a time when so many people were in Jerusalem. It was a special time. Even the Bible talks about an high Sabbath, which may have meant that Jesus was crucified a day or so earlier, thus putting him in the grave three days and three nights with a very special high Sabbath, then a day of preparation, another Sabbath, and then he becomes the first fruit and he comes out of that grave. Regardless of how it played out in terms of how we may understand the days is immaterial. The fact is that Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem just days earlier. The crowds just in adulation. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They looked at him as their Messiah, their Savior in a political way. They never saw the sin that they had before God. Jesus goes to the cross and upon him is the weight of the entire world in terms of 
our sin, my sin, your sin, all of mankind's sin. Jesus' blood was a sufficient and total sacrifice. The ancient Hebrews, they had their sacrifices, but they had to have more sacrifices because of their increasing burden of sin. The blood of lambs and rams and and bulls couldn't do it anymore. Thus we have the Lamb of God. It's amazing that Jesus was born in Bethlehem at a place where the lambs are raised for the sacrifice in the temple. That's where Jesus was born. And now on this Passover, where the blood of a lamb is remembered on the lintel of a door when the children of Israel were freed from Egypt, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And his blood takes away the sin of the world. Jesus completed the work of atoning for our sin debt on the cross, Calvary. That old hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Something else to remember. When Jesus died, sometimes we forget this. At the moment that Jesus died, there was an earthquake. There had been darkness over the land for three hours as he died on that cross. Three hours of darkness. When he died, the veil of the temple was ripped in two, finally opening up the access to God we could not have because of our sin. Jesus' blood paid it all. Jesus, our Savior, crucified, and then buried, but risen again. Listen, right now, we're going to take a break, and we will be back on the other side of this break. We're going to talk more about the hope we find in the resurrected Jesus Christ, because see, it is by the power of his resurrection that we have life eternal. This is Truth to Ponder. With Bob Bierman. Today, one of the most amazing mysteries in human history. Shalom Aleichem. This is the nice Jewish boy, Jonathan Kahn, your Jewish connection, bringing you the riches of your Jewish roots in Jesus. Now get your pen out as fast as you can so you don't miss out on receiving a special free gift you're going to get and love in a moment. Now, what I'm about to tell you has no precedent in human history or in world religions. Listen carefully. The Temple of Jerusalem had three main barriers in its pathway, three symbols that God and man were separated. The first and innermost barrier, the veil of the Holy of Holies. The second and middle barrier, the golden doors of the temple. And the third and outermost barrier, the great brass doors of the Nicanor Gate in the courtyard. Now, the New Testament records that around the year 30 AD, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, died and reconciled man to God. He broke the barriers. When that happened, the first and innermost barrier, the veil, was supernaturally torn in two. But what about the next barrier, the golden doors? Well, amazingly, the writings of the rabbis declare that the golden doors of the temple began to open by themselves when the rabbis say began 30 AD, the same year Yeshua, Jesus died. Now there's more. What about the last barrier, the bronze gate? Amazingly, the Jewish historian Josephus recorded that before the temple was destroyed, the great bronze doors of the Nicanor gate, which took 20 men to open and close, all of a sudden opened by itself, scared everybody. This is awesome, awesome stuff. Even though rabbis and Josephus unwittingly bear witness to the powerful truth. God is awesome and Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. So don't live any longer in fear or doubt or gloom, my friend. Walk in the powerful power through the gates, through the doors and through the veils because he's real. He really does have the power to open any barrier and he has opened up to you the gates of righteousness and the path of life and glory. Want more on this? Well, you know what? This is the free gift for you. The mystery hidden for 2,000 years in the sands of Israel, better than Raiders of the Lost Ark, and it's real. The mystery of the temple doors are a free gift for you, and Sapphire is your daily spiritual vitamin supply for victorious life in God. How do you get all these free gifts? Just call now. Remember Jesus' Hebrew name and call it Yeshua. Call 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's 1-800-CALL-NOW-Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. 
I invite you to minister with me in bringing the good news back to the people who gave it to you, Israel, and the unreached peoples of every tribe and tongue on five continents. Just call now. 1-800-YESHUA-1. That's Y-E-S-H-U-A-1. Or write me direct, The Nice Jewish Boy, Box 1111, Lodi, New Jersey, 07644. That's Box 1111, Lodi, L-O-D-I, New Jersey, 07644. Until next time, this is Jonathan Kahn saying, Shalom Lechem. Peace be to you, my friend, in Messiah Ravinu. Our teacher. This is Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. And welcome back to this very special edition of Truth to Ponder. I'm your host, Bob Bierman. Normally, this program spends a lot of time talking about the the headlines of the day, the news. Sometimes I feel like I'm doing a countdown to when Jesus will be coming back when I watch some of the insanity in the news. But for this weekend, we're going to put the news headlines aside and we're going to focus on the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we open up this segment, I want to take a moment to thank all of you that listen to the program on shortwave radio and also those that listen as a podcast means a lot to me if you're a podcast listener to the program and i want to thank those that have financially supported the program to keep it on international shortwave the airtime is not free and we're thankful for every gift we receive large and small it seems that every month there's just enough to make it all come together. So thank you in advance as we now prepare to keep raising the funds during this month to be ready for the next month. If you want to help support the ministry, you can do so. And you can do it from our website, truth2ponder.com. Truth2ponder.com. And our mailing address in Georgia is 21 Berkshire Lane. That's Berkshire, which is spelled B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E. 21 Berkshire Lane. Add the number 263 in Sky Valley. Two words. Sky Valley, Georgia. And the zip code is 30537. Once again, 21 Berkshire, B E R K. S-H-I-R-E, Berkshire Lane, number 263, in Sky Valley, Georgia, 30537. And I want to thank you for listening and helping to keep this program on the air. Right now, I want to change the focus of my attention and your attention. As As we think about this week, we spent some time during the week talking about the days that many of us are familiar with from maybe our church going. We, we're we familiar with Good Friday. We're familiar with Easter Sunday, many even Monday, Thursday. And we talked on Wednesday how the dating could have been just a little bit different. It doesn't make any difference. The fact is, Jesus is our Passover lamb. He celebrated the Passover, gave his disciples what we call the new mandate. A new commandment I give unto you. And they celebrated that first communion together. And and I don't think the disciples understood that night when Jesus said, I will not partake of any of this, this fruit of the vine, until we are again with our Heavenly Father. And I don't think they, they understood that at all. Remember, even the disciples, in spite of all the miracles they have seen, have not quite understood the fullness of Jesus' mission on this earth. They have made a lot of assumptions along the way on what the mission is. And those that welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem were looking for a political savior, a political leader to overthrow Rome. That's what they thought the Messiah was going to be. And they were wrong. And that's why within a matter of days, they turn from singing Hosanna in the highest, and blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, to screaming, crucify him. 
those of the temple plotted to to kill Jesus. They couldn't do it themselves, so they decided to use the power of the Roman Empire by accusing him of of claiming to be a king greater than Caesar. Let the Romans do their dirty work. You remember, as I talked earlier, about the garden experience and Jesus being taken away and then nailed upon that cross, crucified, and he died. Jesus is placed in a borrowed tomb. Now, you got to remember, by this time, after the crucifixion, all the disciples have disappeared. They don't want to be picked up by the Romans as being an accomplice. They, their lives are now in danger. And they go into hiding. Those of the temple warned Pontius Pilate, you know, this guy claimed that he would rise from the dead. We don't want to have somebody steal the body, you understand, and claim that he did rise. And so Pontius Pilate dispatches some guards for that tomb to cover that time of three days to make sure the body is not stolen. And there during those three days and three nights, at some point, Inside that tomb, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus comes alive in the flesh. And Jesus gets up, takes off his linen, and then the stone is rolled away from his grave. They took my Savior down from the cross, their hearts in despair. All hope was lost They laid him down In a cold bar or two Covered his body With the stone sealed the room His friends gathered close And wondered what now Their Lord was gone started to doubt Then someone cried out We are now surely lost All hope for salvation Died on that cross Then a voice in the morning Cried out at the gate The Master Truth 
to Ponder with Bob Bierman. Once again, this is our very special Good Friday and Easter edition of Truth to Ponder, and I'm your host, Bob Bierman. I'm so thankful that you're with us for this special time, and I hope that the words that I'm sharing and the music you're hearing is stirring your heart and mind into something greater than who we are, greater than the problems we face, greater than our politics, and greater than the news of the day. This news, this this good news of Jesus' resurrection is something we really need to, to grasp upon. I want to share something from St. John's Gospel, chapter 20, and it begins at uh, the first verse. I want you to understand that the, the, the stone has been rolled away. Jesus is alive, and there in the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher. And we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes laying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And the disciples went away unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting at one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said this, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and to your God. Imagine. Imagine how she felt seeing her Master alive. And then it, we, we also continue to read, and came the same at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. All they have seen over these days, the trials, the tribulations, his, him being beaten, scorned, mocked, spit upon, crucified, taken off the cross, laid into a tomb. They had no idea what their future was about to hold. Who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? And who told the ocean you can only come this far? And who showed the moon
my favorite newer Easter songs, I Know My Redeemer Lives. Before we close our program today, I want to share some words from Scripture to give you some hope and hopefully to to challenge your thinking. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we are even found to be a false witness of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. This passage of Scripture gives us the sad five, five consequences if Christ is not risen from the dead and he's not alive today as the Lord of our universe with all authority given to him in heaven and in earth. Understand that St. Paul was writing this letter to the church at Corinth where many people there absolutely did not believe in any kind of resurrection. It was a very carnal city very sinful and wicked city, and the whole idea of a redeeming God and eternal life was a foreign concept. If there be no resurrection of the dead, if nobody rises from the dead, Paul points out the obvious, if there is no resurrection, not even Christ has been raised. And he explains explains to us so clearly all the consequences had Christ been not risen from the dead. We that believe in Jesus Christ have the hope of his resurrection, the power of his resurrection. We have the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from our sins. When I do this radio program each day, I know much of it is dealing with with the headlines and the news and the things we need to be concerned about. Politics, pandemics, cancel culture, and, and yes, next week we'll get back to discussing things like the cancel culture and all that we as Christians need to be thoroughly aware. We can't be living in ignorance and not knowing what's going on. But regardless, we need to know no matter how bad things get, if we really have faith, we're just looking for his soon coming again. We should have hope because of the resurrection. I want to thank you for listening today. I want to thank those that support this ministry. If you believe in what we're doing, you can go to our website, truththenumber2ponder.com. Or if you'd like to support us financially, you can make a check out to Ancient Word Radio and send it to 21 Berkshire Lane, B-E-R-K-S-H-I-R-E, 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263. That's number 263, our secure P.O. box here. 21 Berkshire Lane, number 263, and we are in Sky Valley, two words, Sky Valley, Georgia, zip code 30537. That's 30537. This has been Truth to Ponder with Bob Bierman. To find out more, visit our website, truth, the number two, and the word ponder.com. That's truth, the number two, ponder.com. Truth to Ponder, shining the light of truth in a darkening world.